Would you please remain standing for this reading from the scripture? Sorry about that. Okay, we have two readings. First is Isaiah uh, 58, uh, verse 11, and then Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 3. Okay, Isaiah 58, 11. Okay, uh, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. And then Colossians. Since then... You have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Please pray with me and for me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. You may have said at one time or another, I've accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. I've been saved. Now what? What do I do now? Where do I go from here? What's next? Some people accept Christ or saved, but never mature or grow in their faith. And they're cheating themselves out of so much joy and peace. I remember many, many, many long years ago when I was about 11 or 12, being at a revival at the first church in Hondo. And when they gave the altar call, and when they asked anyone who wanted to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior and dedicate their life to Christ to come on down to the altar and pray, I went. I'm not sure I really understood what I was committing to, but I knew I wanted Jesus to be Lord of my life. So I asked him into my heart. I asked him to forgive me of my sins, to guide me and direct me all the days of my life. God wants our heart, all of it, and our devotion. He wants to be number one in my life and in your life, the priority above all priorities. But then, with no spiritual guidance from anyone, I just went back to living my life as I always had, making mistakes, sinning, but still having that yearning in me to have Christ as my Lord and Master. But at that young age, I didn't know what to do, how to do it, or how to live out my faith. 20, 25, 30 years later, maybe even more, uh, even though I had attended church through the years, I was still lost. But I was finally able to open my eyes to see the wonderful Christian ladies that God was putting in my life to nurture me and to lead me closer to him. Some of you have heard me talk about my dear, dear friend Doris, who went to be with the Lord last year. Doris was there to listen to me through thick and thin, and my life had many of both. She didn't judge me. She taught me to trust God no matter what and to depend on him to get out of my own way, to let go and let God lead me and direct me. And she also taught me not to think I had to do something about everything. That was my first lesson 
about being a Martha. And I've had oh so many since. Are you like that? If you see a situation, do you feel you just have to jump in and do something to fix it? Or say something to get things kind of started? Or you just need to straighten them out? She taught me that if I was constantly doing something about everything, I wasn't letting God take care of it. In a way, it was a lack of trust. Or worse, it was me thinking I could do a better job than God could. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. How simple is that? Trust God. Don't think about the problem or the situation. Just give it to him. And then listen for his answer. That is so much easier said than done. I'm much better today at not doing or saying something about everything. I can sit back and keep my mouth shut. Yes, I can. And I do. <laughs> and not react to things that go on. It's hardest, though, in my own family. And I'm sure many of you can identify with that. But I digress. Once you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you should not just sit back and do nothing. We're asked to grow spiritually, to grow in our love of the Lord. So you say, but how? First, through finding a spiritual mentor. Men, find a godly man to talk to. Women, find a godly woman to talk to. Find someone who has something you want spiritually. Someone who has the joy of the Lord in them. God has probably already placed someone or some ones in your life to mentor to you. You just have to open your eyes and be receptive. Call them. Ask them how they got where they are spiritually. And then ask them to pray for you every day. When you have a question about God or just about life, call them. The only caution that I would give you is that that person be scripture-based. In other words, whatever they do and whatever they say does not conflict with scripture. What else besides a mentor? Well, spending time with God is the most important of all. Commit yourself to God daily. You might even say something like, Lord, today I give myself anew to you. Read a devotion each morning to get your day started in the right direction. I personally read a little devotion called Jesus Calling, and it's a wonderful little devotional. Or you can pick up an upper room in the narthex and read something from it each morning. Or there's hundreds of devotionals available. Just pick one. And as Nike puts it, just do it. Each morning, read your devotion, say a prayer, and then listen for God to speak to you. If you have to, get up 10 minutes, oh no, 10 minutes earlier each morning. It will really make a difference in your day. Or if you just can't drag yourself out of bed any earlier, then buy your devotion on a CD and listen to it while you drive to work. Before I retired, I taught in San Antonio. So for many years, this driving time was my most precious time with God. Try it. You'll like it. Spending time with the Lord will grow you more and give you more peace, bring you closer to him than anything else. All relationships require, require nurturing and spending time with one another. Think about your spouse or your best friend. Well, your relationship with Christ is no different. He wants some of your time. He gives you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's 168 hours every single week. How much are you willing to give back to him to develop that personal relationship? One or two hours on Sunday morning is not enough. 
but it is better than nothing. Another now what is study. St and y'all forgive me, but I got to get my glasses on. <laughs> studying, God's <clears throat> studying God's word helps grow you into that mature Christian by developing a strong root system. Just like a tree without a good root system that a strong wind can blow over, you need that strong root system in God's word so that you can withstand the storms of life. You say you don't have time to add a Bible study? Then go to Sunday school or listen to a CD in your car. You don't have time for that? Then jot down a Bible verse on a three by five card and memorize it. So what if it takes you a week or weeks to memorize it? God's not going anywhere. And one of the lamest excuses I've ever heard is I just can't memorize anything. Yes, you can. You either just don't want to, or you're not trying, or you're just being lazy. Memorized scripture will stay in your heart and will come back to you in times of need. Don't cheat yourself. Memorize. And if you don't know what to memorize, ask a Christian friend what their favorite verse is, or I'll be happy to share some of my favorites with you. Several of us here at church used to memorize a verse each week, and every Sunday morning we, before church, we would gather and we would recite our memorized verse to each other. And this held us accountable for memorizing. So find a friend to memorize with or I'll memorize with you. Just stop making excuses. A fourth way to answer the now what question is to get involved in the fellowship of the church. There are so many, many ways to do this. This is where you will get to know your fellow Christians, serve your Lord, usher, greet, lay read, volunteer in the nursery, and we really, really need volunteers in this area. Work in the kitchen during church-wide events or funerals. If you're musically inclined, check with our music director, Mark Weemers. I know he can find a place for you. Join the Ron Robin groups. Go to Sunday school. There's that one again. Serving or being our servant or being a servant is a sign of Christian matur maturity. And Philippians 2.7 tells us it is the true mark of Christ who took on the very nature of a servant. Psalm 100 verse two says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with thanksgiving and joy. Stay in the fellowship of God's people. And last, but by no means least, pray. Pray each day for your family. Pray for your church. Pray for wisdom and discernment in hearing God's nudging you to serve where he wants you to serve. Make no decision without prayer. Don't make decisions based on how you feel at the moment. Make decisions based on prayer. This keeps you from rushing in and committing yourself before you consult God. It guards against people pleasing. There are over a hundred verses in the Bible concerning prayer. So look up prayer in the concordance of your Bible in the back and read a few. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 6 says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And Psalm 121 verses one and two says, I will lift my eyes up to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord. There's three verses you could memorize. Spiritual growth requires time. God will honor the time we commit to learning more about him, the time we spend with him. A verse from Isaiah encourages me. And here the prophet Isaiah wrote, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. 
When we spend time with the Lord, we are able to soar, to walk, and to run in God's perfect timing. And as Pastor Mel told us last Sunday, God's timing is not our timing. There are many heroes in the Bible who soared because they'd been with the Lord. To mention just a few, Moses was the adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter and lived with every privilege. And then God took him into the desert to be a shepherd for 40 years. After those 40 years of God preparing him, Moses burst on the scenes with signs and wonders and miracles and faithful service to God. John the Baptist lived 30 years in the wilderness, wearing animal skins and eating locusts and wild honey. Then John burst on the scene, preaching like no man ever had. John's ministry lasted about a year, but it demanded lengthy spiritual preparation. Paul was a terrible somebody who persecuted Christians. But then one day he was dramatically converted from a Christian hater to a Christian, and he spent three silent years in the Arabian desert. After those three years, during which God prepared him for an amazing ministry, Paul burst on the scene preaching, teaching, and working signs and miracles. And then there's our Jesus. As God in flesh, he too put in his time in obscurity, away from the crowds. He spent 30 years with family, time in a carpenter's workshop, and then 40 days of prayer and fasting in the wilderness. And then one day, Jesus burst on the scene exhibiting the power and glory of God in action. But after 30 years of preparation, his earthly ministry only lasted three short years. Now, I'm not saying you're going to burst on the scene like these guys did, preaching and teaching, but you will be equipped to serve your Lord in whatever way he has for you. So whether you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior yesterday, two weeks ago, or 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, what do you do now? You, and I'm going to repeat, find a mentor. God will provide. He gave me a second mentor several years before Doris died. He'll give you one too. Just ask. Second, spend time with God. Start your new year allotting a specific time to be with him. Start out small. Something is always better than nothing. Third, study. Just memorize one scripture this week. And then when you've memorized it, if it's taken you a month, <coughs> memorize another one. And read scripture daily. Fourth, get involved in the fellowship of the church. Do one thing you've never done. Sunday school, usher, nursery volunteer, and the list goes on and on. And fifth, pray. Beginning your day with prayer is important. Even before you get out of bed, ask God to lead your day. And then pray all day long. Thank you, God, for my safe travel to work. Thank you for the parking place. Thank you for my food, for the clouds. You get the message. And one last note, you never, ever graduate. I still have a mentor. I still spend time with God each day. I still study and memorize. I'm still involved, and I still pray. God has done his part. He has saved you. He's given you eternal life. He's blessed you with all spiritual blessings. He's gifted you for ministry. And he's a prepared a place for you in heaven. And now he calls you to do your part, to catch his vision, to set aside time, to make growth in him a goal, to spend time and energy so that he can prepare you for ministry, and to trust him to provide you with opportunities to minister and enrich his people out of the overflow of your own joy-filled and enriched life. It's a full-time, <coughs> lifelong process, but you will reap untold rewards. 
Amen. Amen.